Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for the fourth and final program in Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. At this hour, the campaign for the U.S. Senate. Appearing as the Libertarian Party candidate, Ricky Dale Harrington, Jr. This year, there is no Democratic Party nominee. The Republican incumbent, Senator Tom Cotton, chose not to participate. Now, there is precedent for our decision to go forward tonight with a single candidate. Several years ago, an incumbent U.S. representative, a Democrat, chose not to debate, and his Republican opponent was questioned alone for the hour. Following his opening statement, Mr. Harrington will be questioned by a panel of Arkansas journalists. George Jarrett of Talk Business and Politics, Donna Terrell of Fox 16, and Steve Brauner, an independent journalist. Our timekeeper is Melissa Barlow of Arkansas PBS. Before we begin, one more time, we would note that we've followed all the protocols for the COVID-19 era, especially distancing and masking. We removed our masks only moments ago. And with that, Mr. Harrington, thank you for being with us. Your opening statement, sir, two minutes. Thank you for having me here. I just wanted to express my gratitude to Arkansas PBS for having this event. And I am humbled by your integrity of still having this, even though my opponent, Senator Cotton, chose not to show up. And I also would like to thank him for giving me a great and wonderful birthday present so that I can speak directly to the people of Arkansas and make my case to be their representative in the United States Senate. In saying that, I just want to speak from my heart. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about the people of this country. It's about those who are on different spectrums of political philosophy. It's about you. Right now in our country, we're in pain. We're in emotional pain, we're in a physical pain, mental pain. We're in pain from the uncertainty of what's going on right now in our country. I'm sure there are people right now in this very state that are opening up their light bill again and again, and that number continues to go up. You don't know how to pay for it right now, and you don't know how you're going to pay for it in the future. I want you to know that I feel your pain. And what we need to do right now as a people is come together and work together. And I give you my word that as your senator, I will work for the people. I will try to find that balance that we need so that it's just not one solution from one side or one solution from the other side, but a solution that's going to benefit us all. And I hope that that message comes through this evening. And if you would please just indulge a preacher for just a moment, I'd like to share with you something that I learned from my college professor. He taught me conflict resolution. And he said, the gospel message is not about issues. It's about people. And I think that translates to what's going on right now in our country. We fight over issues, but the heart of the matter is that there are people on the other side of those issues that have those that they love. They want to see their children grow up. They want to make a life for themselves. So it doesn't matter your political affiliation. What matters is people. And with that, sir, I hate, I hate to interrupt a man of the cloth, but <laughs> it is time for questioning to begin. And the first question tonight comes from George Jarrett. George? Mr. Harrington, you're running for the U.S. Senate in a presidential election year. Um, 
Donald Trump is on the ballot again, uh, seeking re-election as President of the United States. In what ways would you align with him if you were elected and he's re-elected, and in what ways would you defer from him? Well, I will think about the deferment, of course. Um, one of my big issues is war powers. And our country has been involved in military police actions for several decades. And the Senate has constitutional powers, war powers. And what we need to do is we need to reel back the executive branch from continuously engaging in military police actions and to bring our troops home and to make sure that when the United States goes to war, it is for the defense of the nation. Now, on some areas that I might agree with President Trump on are issues of, let's see, he signed an uh, executive order, I believe, increasing funding for the study of how autism is affecting uh, people in our country right now. And my two children, uh, two oldest children are on the autism spectrum. And we need more people to be in the profession to help those who have autism. Um, I keep reading stories over and over again about someone that's on the spectrum and their caretaker being shot or apprehended by police because of the person who has autism having a, a meltdown, as, as they would say. And I think about my son, my oldest son, and I would just hate for something to happen to him because he doesn't have um, the right services that he needs, or not only just him, but all the children of America who are struggling with the condition. And I applaud him on that. We should always give credit where credit is due. And as a senator, my goal is to, to be pragmatic and to work uh, with the executive branch, but also do my job in checking that power. George, follow up? Yes, Mr. Harrington. And as a follow up to that question, is there any other ways that you think you would defer from the current president? Um, I guess the most obvious is Rhetoric. <laughs> the most obvious is, is the rhetoric. Um, what we need right now is someone to unite our country. And I, I don't want to disparage anyone that supports the president, but we need a leader in the White House that is going to unite us. Next question, Mr. Rell. Thank you. Mr. Harrington, Senator Tom Cotton has spoken out against the 1619 Project. It's a school curriculum that aims to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the center of the national narrative. Senator Cotton believes the, pro the project exaggerates the truth, and he drew strong criticism referring to slavery as a necessary evil. With that said, what is your stance on the 1619 Project? My stance on the 1619 Project is that it is a story of a group of Americans that has not been told fully. And it is a part of our identity as Americans. The stain of slavery on this country that proclaims to be for liberty, equality, and justice for all. And Senator Cotton's comments on that, it maligns an entire group of people who have a history that bear those scars in their soul. And I'm thinking about my own family's history. I know I'm a, I'm a black man, and my race colors my existence and experience in this country. And I know that my experience is not as bad as my father or mother's experience being black in America, and surely not as bad as my grandparents who grew up in Jim Crow South, and my grandmother's brother was lynched. So these are stories that need to be told, not to point fingers at someone or to place blame, but so that the family of America can come together and we can move past this issue of racism, injustice, and inequality, and move forward to the blessings of liberty and equality. 
And with that, I need to go to Mr. Brauner for the next question. Follow you can up. you can follow up in a moment. Okay. Donna, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Mr. Trangton, libertarians typically want as little government action as possible, if not zero government action. How should policymakers be approaching a pandemic where one person's actions can affect another, often inadvertently? I remember my high school civics class, and my teacher, she told me that our freedom is just like going out and swinging our fist around as much as we want, as hard as we want, as fast as we want. But that freedom ends whenever you hit someone else in the face. And there's a lot of talk about the reaction to COVID-19. And my problem with what has happened has to deal with how we have politicized this virus so much that if you're a part of one particular tribe, you believe that it's really serious and it's going to kill us all, or you're part of one other tribe and it is a hoax. And I'm, I, feel, I feel very disturbed by that because how can we as a people know that something is, is harming other people, go to our echo chambers, and not see the hurt of others. Now, to address your question of, of government involvement in this, it's a tricky situation because the Constitution binds the government on what they can and what they cannot do. And we should take a look at this as a serious issue that is affecting the lives of people. And sometimes we have to galvanize together to tackle this, but we have not been given the chance because it has been so highly politicized. Back to George Jared. Mr. Harrington, obviously your opponent, um, U.S. Senator Tom Cotton, has a lengthy record in Congress and in the U.S. Senate. Could you tell us one or two things that he's done or said that you vehemently disagree with? Well, the number one thing, of course, is his statement on America's criminal justice system, that we do not have an over-incarceration problem, but we have an under-incarceration problem. And the United States holds almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And the state of Arkansas has one of the highest incarceration rates per capita. Not the number one, but is surely in the top 10 in our nation. And I was a former employee of the Arkansas Department of Corrections. I started working as a chaplain and later moved up uh, to another position where I was overseeing the programs to help rehabilitate men. And our criminal justice system has been monetized. And this is the main issue. We know people do bad things and they should be punished for what they have done. But there should be no innocent people in prison. And surely no innocent people should be condemned to death via le uh, lethal injection. So Senator Cotton, I, I extremely disagree with him on our criminal justice here in the United States. Next question, Ms. Terrell. The U.S. Supreme Court is set to hear the case on the Affordable Care Act uh, after the election, and their decision could actually do away with it. Do you think it should be abolished? And if so, what do you think should be the alternative for millions of Americans who would need health care? Mm. I personally benefited from the Affordable Care Act. And there are a lot of people that benefited from it as well. And then there are people that did not benefit from the Affordable Care Act. And so during the 2016 election cycle, there was a chant to repeal and replace Obamacare, why not amend it rather than repeal and, and replace? And we all know how that vote came down. My opinion on it is this, and now we see um, a movement for Medicare for all. So we have two different opinions going on. My vision is to try to bring those together for something that benefits 
those who want public health care and those who would like to go with private insurance. We need to work together. Next question, Mr. Brawner. So going back to the earlier question about the pandemic, uh, should there be a national mask mandate, a state mask mandate, or neither? I believe that it should be at the local level. But I do know that the national government, or the federal government, has an obligation when it comes to things like this, when it comes to natural disasters, when it comes to an invasion, and when it comes to pandemics like these. Uh, it's within the jurisdiction of uh, the national government through organizations like FEMA to, to spearhead issues like this. Um, the real crux of it is are we going to force people to do something? And I, I'm not one who is for forcing someone to do something. My hope is that all of the adults in this country would behave like adults. We teach children not to harm others. We teach children not to say poor things about others. We teach children to be nice and caring towards others. My question is, why can't adults live up to what we are trying to teach children? I think if things got worse, a national mandate shouldn't be off the table. George Jarrett. As a follow-up to the previous question I asked you, I asked you about Senator Cotton's record and things that you've disagreed with uh, some of the things he's done. What are some things that he's done that you agree with? To be honest, I can't think of one. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you straightforward, I just really can't think of one. Um, I respect Senator Cotton as a human being. When it comes to ideas, when it comes to actions, and when it comes to words, we are diametrically opposed. Ms. Farrell. There is now a greater focus on you. You are the last man standing, literally, because two other candidates wanted to unseat Tom Cotton, but they are not here. The latest polls show an 11-point spread between you and the senator. There are still some undecided voters out there. But that said, there are still people who have no idea who you are, and they don't realize that Senator Cotton has uh, an opponent in this race. So moving forward beyond this debate, how do you plan to get your message out there and let people know that you are a candidate for U.S. Senate? Well, I'm very appreciative for this moment right now because I have a chance to speak directly to Arkansans and let them know where I stand and what I hope to accomplish. Um, my schedule is, is filled. It's <laughs> It's getting packed right now for events because people are, are learning now that there's another candidate after being told that Tom Cotton has been running unopposed. And right now, I, I guess it kind of looks like I'm running unopposed with him not being here. But I want to get out. I want to talk to our Kansans. I want to look them in the face. I want to hear their concerns. And I want to see how I can best serve them in the United States Senate. Steve Bronner. Mr. Arrington, the national debt has grown $4 trillion since Christmas and is now $27 trillion. The federal budget deficit is expected to be $3.3 .3 trillion this year. It, your website says you would reduce the tax burden on Americans. So what would you cut in spending to get us to balance? And have you done the math? That's a really good question right there. The first thing that I would be interested in cutting, of course, I'm going to look at the military budget, of course. And whenever I talk about the military budget, it's not the, the soldiers, the airmen, the sailors, the Marines who put themselves in harm's way to serve this country. We need them and the morale at as high as it can be, ready to go out 
and defend America. But we spend a lot of money on defense contracts, going to Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and other co uh, companies that build weapons for our nation. And we really need to take a look at that. We need to take a look at how much money we are spending on that and what we can cut. I can tell you right now, I'm, when it comes to people, I've been a missionary and I know what it's like to go around begging for money to go do a good work. And that's hard. And I know what it's like to have to go without. And I'm definitely not in favor of cutting programs that help out people because nobody is living the high life on $750 a month. Back to George Jarrett. Mr. Harrington, um, and could you please give us an honest answer about how you feel about your opponent choosing not to come here today and debate you, which is a, uh, a time-honored tradition in American politics? I'll tell you honestly, I was more afraid of you guys than I was afraid of Senator Cotton. Um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I was looking forward to looking him in the face and talking about the issues and having an intellectual debate on policy. And um, it's disheartening. And I understand the political move of it. Um, you, don't want to believe, you don't want to breathe life into your opponent's campaign. I'm a nobody. Nobody knows who I am. I'm a third party candidate. And for him to show up here would breathe life into it. He's on Fox News, I don't know how many times a week, two, three times a week, but he can't come here to address the people of Arkansas. Why would you want to support someone who does that? Ms. Terrell. As you know, the country has been divided with protests after the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. Many people are calling for strong police reforms and to defund the police, which means reducing police department budgets and redistributing funds towards social services. As a libertarian candidate, what is your position on defunding police and police reform? Thank you for that question. My father was a correctional officer. He rose up to the ranks of sergeant and he drilled into me the scared straight, <laughs> uh, stay out of trouble. He told me of some of the struggles he had working in corrections. And this is, this is the crux of it. It's not about hatred of police. It's about holding those accountable who have derived authority for the actions that they take whenever they violate people's constitutional amendments and just betray the public's trust. And I want people to, to hear this when it comes to the word or the phrase defund the police. In my opinion, it's about reallocating funds. It's about making sure our police departments are not militarized. And I'd like to explain my reasoning behind this. Our military is not deployed domestically to put down unrest because they are trained to go out and crush the enemies of America. Now, if we had the military out amongst the streets, policing just like our civilian police force, the message that it sends is that the people are the enemy. And whenever our police departments have, has equipment, just like our military, what type of message is that sending to the people of America? That you are the enemy. And so going forward, we want to make sure that our police officers are able to come home to their families. We understand that. They have loved ones as well as me, yourself, and everyone in this country. But there are sometimes you don't need to use the hammer for every occasion. Sometimes you can de-escalate a situation without having to go to that point of violence. And I understand that it might be a tactic to gain control of the situation, to ramp it up to that violent point. But I'd like to see our officers have a little bit more training in de-escalation and um, 
maybe have other uh, law enforcement uh, employees that are trained in other types of de-escalation tactics. Mr. Bronner, what is your position on abortion? This is my position on abortion, and I'd like to explain that through one of my personal experiences. I was, of course, a chaplain at the Cummins unit, and I was serving in the capacity as a chaplain during the executions of April 2017. So at night, I had to make myself available for the families of the victim. And during the daytime, make myself available for the families of the condemned. So I'm right in the middle of two opposite and opposing situations. And people, during that time, I remember people arguing about the merits of the death penalty and whether we should have it or not. But I didn't have that luxury because I was tasked with one thing, to provide a service, to provide care, and to be there for those who were hurting. My stance on abortion is this, is that we, as a people, should spend more time caring for others, caring for the young lady who's caught in that situation has to make that decision whether or not she's going to keep the baby. I can imagine, I cannot imagine what that is like because I am a man and I'm not a woman. I personally do not agree with it, but I believe that if someone's health is at risk, it's between them, their God, their family. And the goal is of course, to try to reduce abortions. But we need to try another way because fighting it out through the legislative process and fighting it out in the courts just isn't working. George Jarrett. Uh, Mr. Harrington, as an addendum to Mr. Bronner's question, so you were on uh, death row in April of 2017 when four of the eight executions took place. Um, what is your stance on the death penalty, and could you also talk about maybe some, maybe give us an anecdote or two of maybe some conversations you had when you were on de the death row unit, maybe with the victim's family, or even maybe the condemned, them or their family? Could you maybe give us an anecdote? Okay. Um, to clarify, uh, death row is at the Varner unit, and uh, Cummins is where the death house is, where the executions are carried out. And so, Working at Cummins, our duty was to, to carry out the mandate of the courts. Um, what strikes me the most is Liddell Lee. And right now, um, the ACLU is trying to get uh, DNA evidence to try to see if he was actually uh, the one that had committed the crime and evidence that might exonerate him. And to go straight to the question, if that evidence does exonerate him, I'm totally opposed to the death penalty. And I w I'd like to, to talk about his family, actually. I don't, I don't know um, them personally, um, but I, sp I spoke to them after the execution was carried out and his, his nephew, and I, I'd like to apologize to the family as well. His nephew was incarcerated there at Cummins as well, and he came to the chaplains um, and explaining to us that um, the, the inmates there were kind of, kind of gigging him a little bit. Hey man, they about to do this to your uncle right here. And he came to us just trying to find some solace and myself, the senior chaplain, another chaplain, and the chief of the chaplains we sat down with him and we tried to, to calm him down. We tried to let the wardens know what was going on so there wouldn't be a fight or any further violence because of his situation. Mr. Rowe. 
Mr. Harrington, the pandemic is in the forefront of everything. We can't even have this debate without social distancing. Governor Hutchinson has extended the health emergency. Many Arkansans have died, and while some have fared quite well after contracting the disease, others have become very sick. So at this point, what do you suggest needs to be done so that we can move on and get the virus behind us? I'd like to make a comment on something right quick. Um, we continue to bring up the number of people that have died from the disease. That is horrible. I couldn't imagine having to say goodbye to one of my relatives in the manner that a lot of Americans have. It's a tragedy. And in saying that, I think the main point is the number of people who have had the disease. We don't consider the economic cost of human suffering. Um, I've, I've had family members and friends that have contracted COVID-19, and they say they do not wish it on the worst of enemies that they have. And what we really need to do right now is to set aside preconceived ideas for our government to be completely honest with the people on what's going on with COVID-19. And we can't really come up with a plan if there's no honesty from our government. And our government has an obligation to the people to be forthright, to be transparent and honest so that we can make decisions for our families, so that we can make decisions for our businesses, and we can make decisions for our schools. But that is what we need. We need transparency, honesty, and a clear path going forward. And until we have that, we're all blind and wandering in the dark. Steve Bronner. If you're elected, you will likely be the only libertarian in the Senate. So have you thought about what happens if you win? Have you thought about how that would work? How would you get committee assignments? where you would find staff? Have you thought about winning? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, I've thought about winning. And for me, the main question I've been receiving now is, if you win, who are you going to caucus with? And the answer to that question is, there's no other libertarians in the Senate, so I will caucus with neither parties and work with both of them. I would try to use my position to, I know I'm just one man. I know that. And human beings have limitations. But I am firmly committed to trying to get us to work together. That is what we need. And if the Democrats, would, the Democrats in Washington would like to get their legislative agenda passed, we've got to work together. If the Republicans would like to get their legislative agenda passed, we've got to work together. And it is amazing what human beings can accomplish when nobody cares who gets the credit. George Jarrett. Mr. Harrington, in this race, you have a Republican opponent, the sitting senator from Arkansas, uh, Tom Cotton, and there are no Democrats in this race. So obviously you're gonna have to put together a coalition of libertarians, Democrats, and Republicans in order um, to get elected. So there's a big, I guess, a, a swath of Democrat votes out there, Democrat, votes. So could you tell us how you're going to appeal to Democrat voters in the state of Arkansas this election cycle? Okay. Well, I'd definitely like to address uh, my fellow Arkansans who happen to be affiliated with the Democratic Party that I am committed to you. I'm committed to Republicans. I'm committed to libertarians. I'm committed to independence because that is what we need. We do not need an elected official who's only going to represent one particular facet of our population. Mr. Rowe. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of this debate that you have two children on the autism spectrum. Um, you have also said, which I have noticed uh, in, in other publications, that there needs to be more medical professionals to yes. help 
in those areas uh, with people who have disabilities. So if you were Senator, what kind of legislation would you propose that could help families who have loved ones with disabilities such as yourself? Well, right now, the waiver waiting list uh, for myself, we are above 2,000. And we don't have enough people entering into that profession. And for me, I, I really have a bone to pick with occupational licensing. We need standards. It's obvious that we need standards. We need to make sure that people are properly vetted. We also need to make sure that they are competent in the jobs that they are trying to, uh, to do. But if those standards that we have prevent people from entering the job market, we need to reevaluate those standards, or the process, I should say. Well, to be an applied behavioral analysis you, uh, analyst, you need to have a master's degree. That costs money. You need to have the training and the time to, to do it before you can practice it. And of course, you need to be certified. Well, we understand this, but is there another way for people to engage in those professions without having to jump through so many hoops. If someone is naturally talented at working with young children, is there a way for us to maybe cut some of the red tape out so we can have what we need? And what we need is people who are competent, who can complete the job, and who can help families. So I'm informed, uh, excuse me, I am in favor of occupational licensing reform. Mr. Bronner, who are the political leaders who you admire the most and have shaped you the most? I would have to say uh, Dwight Eisenhower is one of my favorite uh, men of history. He was a very pragmatic man he was Supreme Allied Commander during the World War II. And of course, for a lot of people, he was one of the greatest presidents uh, in our history by their opinion. And he was a remarkable man. And secondly for me is Abraham Lincoln. And the reason I admire Abraham Lincoln so much was he endured a lot in his life. While he was trying to weather the storm of a civil war, he had family issues. He had issues with his marriage. He previously had a son pass away. And while he was in office, he had another son pass away, if I'm remembering my history correctly. He had a lot on his plate. But in, even while he was enduring those trials, he persevered. That is what I admire about Abraham Lincoln, is the perseverance. Because it's easy to give up, but it's hard to wade through the difficulty, wade through the struggle, and be so laser focused on accomplishing your goal. It takes heart. Back to George Jarrett. Mr. Harrington, interesting that you would invoke the name of Dwight Eisenhower up until about two weeks before he accepted the Republican nomination. Both parties were trying to get him to run on their ticket, so maybe he was the first libertarian. <laughs> um, as a side note, um, could you give us maybe one or two personal anecdotes about yourself? If you had to describe yourself in two or three minutes or tell people about yourself in a way that they would understand um, your experience and where you come from, and so you can maybe identify with people who are watching this. Yes, sir. I'm a complicated man with simple tastes. I've got in the ministry when I was 19 years old, and I haven't looked back. And what got me in ministry was the campus minister and the pulpit minister at the church in Kilgore, Texas, they sat me down in the office and said, we think you need to get in the ministry. You don't have any say about this. <laughs> and uh, 
I joined the Adventures and Missions program in Lubbock, Texas, and that is where I got my training, initial training in Bible, and I was sent to Scotland. And the Scottish people are a very amazing people. They have a wonderful sense of humor. And uh, if they're not making fun of you, then you can surely be, uh, you can know they don't like you. And um, I learned a lot while I was over there. The United Kingdom is a socialist country. And so I experienced what it's like to live in a socialist country. After I finished my time serving the elderly there, serving at the primary schools, and um, just engaging in humanitarian efforts, I came back to Harding. I got a scholarship uh, to attend uh, the Center for Advanced Ministry Training and graduated with a bachelor's in ministry. And I will say this, when I left Searcy in 2013, it was the first time in my life at 28 that I felt homesick. That was, the, I, I really felt it in my soul whenever I moved to Baltimore for an associate pastor position. I came to Arkansas in 2008 after being a missionary in Scotland and killed my first deer. I've always wanted to hunt, but I never had anybody to take me hunting. And I was hooked after that. Uh, fishing up in Pangburn, I was just blown out of the water that you can catch rainbow trout hand over fist with a can of corn. Ain't no trout fishing <laughs> from where I'm from in Texas. And one thing that has shaped me tremendously is my work in mission work, my work in Searcy at the psychiatric hospital that has shaped my, my opinions and ideas on health care as well as my mission work in the People's Republic of China. And that was some of the most difficult time in my life. And in saying that, I wouldn't change it for the world because of the knowledge and the miles that were put on my soul being there. It was difficult. Just two weeks before I left China, a pastor and his wife were bulldozed to death. A lot of people talk about communism in America. Oh, this is communist right here. Oh, that's communist. I think about a moment during my training to become a minister. And we had a classmate, a compatriot, who was from Hungary. And one of my other classmates got to talking badly about President Obama and said, oh, Obama's trying to turn America into a communist nation. And my classmate who was from Hungary, he said, communism, you know nothing of communism. And in reality, how much do we really know about communism? I'm not making a case for communism here at all. I'm saying the preconceived ideas that we have, the words that politicians use to drive up fear in people when there should be no fear. But I can tell you what it's like being in the People's Republic of China. My opponent, Senator Cotton, is always talking about China. He's been the champion for the Hong Kong people who are trying to establish democracy for themselves separate from the People's Republic of China during the protests. The people of Hong Kong clashed with police because they were trying to get their freedom. But whenever Americans are protesting, what did Senator Cotton say? I'm sure you know what he said. And I'm here to say that that is wrong. People who do bad things, still Americans, they still have constitutional rights. And I hope you hear what I'm saying right now. We do not need a sitting senator to advocate for no quarter on American citizens. Uh, Ms. Terrell or is it Mr. Brawner? Ms. Terrell, I think. Yes, thank you. I want to take you back to something uh, you were talking about earlier. You said that um, there is not an under-incarceration problem, there is an over-incarceration problem. And I've also heard you say that you were looking forward to the opportunity um, of looking your opponent in the eye and having this conversation with him. So I, I guess I would just like to ask you, um, Senator Cotton could very well see this broadcast. So 
if you had the opportunity to look him in the eye or in the camera in this case and tell him your thoughts on that, what would you say? I would say this right here, that working in the prison system opened my eyes to a, a world that I knew a little bit about, but I personally experienced it. And when we have people that are thrown in prison for possession charges of, of substances, they are subjected to a lot of things. They are subjected to being recruited by gangs. They are subjected to sexual assault. They are subjected to uh, getting a PhD in criminology. And I don't mean the academic criminology, I mean being a proficient criminal. And my main goal on criminal justice reform is making sure that the people that we, are, we incarcerate are the ones that have harmed other human beings. We do not need to send people to prison when there is no victim, especially with drug possession charges. Um, I'm thinking about a, a man who had three life sentences plus 25, and it was for uh, moving drugs. That is what he did. But three life sentences, it seemed a little excessive. Steve Bronner. Uh, do you believe that humanity is causing climate change? And if so, what should be done about it? Well, I love science. And I know that might sound odd as a person of faith because the conversation is always um, Faith and science are polar opposites. There's no co-mingling. Uh, but um, by my faith, I, I know that God created this world and that he also created science. And human beings, we affect our environment. That is the truth. And I also know that in watching uh, and listening to other scientists talk, our world goes through cycles of change. There's been ice age, there's been heating up, but um, what we have going on right now is a result of industrialization. And we do affect our environment. That's a measurable, I mean, it's a real thing. When I was living in Northern China during the winter time, I had to wear a mask outside because the, the smog and the smoke was so thick that you could barely see the sun. So we, we do affect our environment. Now the crux, the crux of it, I believe, is an issue of economics. It's using the government to favor one side or the other side, to favor the oil and gas industry or to favor renewable industries. And I don't think that that is what should be done I think uh, the, what's playing out economically should play out amongst the, the industries themselves without government involvement. But I also believe that we have a moral obligation to make sure that we take care of what we have. Christians use this term being good stewards. And we have to be good stewards of the planet that we've been given. George Jones. Mr. Harrington, if you're elected, um, all elected officials go into their new office with an agenda. So on the first day, if you win this seat, what will be the first thing you try to push? And what I'm talking about is a bill or um, some type of legislation. What will you push for your first day in the U.S. Senate? I want to I wanna work on health care. Um, that's really important to me. And I want to come up with solutions to our problem that we, we are facing. And it's a, it's a problem of ideas. It's a problem of raising or rising health care costs. That's, that's the problem right there. We live in the most prosperous nation in the world, yet there are still people who go without. There are still people that go bankrupt for medical reasons. And that's, that's just a travesty living in this nation here, and there are people that go bankrupt because they are just trying to live. And I just, I just disagree with 
uh, a lot of things that are going on with our healthcare system. And my, my main idea is, is this, is that until we change the culture of healthcare, it won't change. It has to start at the very bottom. It can't start at the top. And so if elected senator, I want to remove the obstacles that are in the way from people that want to open up a hospital. This is something that I attempted in Pine Bluff. Um, but we have to, to, to wade through the red tape. We have to get other people's permission. We're trying to open up a uh, mental health facility. We need more mental health care in this country. That's what we need. But whenever you have to go get your competition's permission to open something up, I just have an absolute problem with that. And so we need to fix this. And that is something that I hope to do if the people of Arkansas choose me as their senator. We thank you, sir. And that concludes the question and answer portion of the program. Mr. Harrington, you have two minutes for a closing statement. Again, I would like to thank you all for having this and say again how humbled I am by your integrity. I'd like to speak to the people of Arkansas. You know who you are. You know where you've come from. Our country has been through a great many struggles. We've been through revolutionary war, a civil war, numerous conflicts, the Spanish flu, two world wars, the turmoil of the civil rights movement. But I know one thing. I know that the people of America are resilient. I know that they never back down from a challenge. During the 2008 mortgage crisis, we endured that. And right now, we are enduring turmoil in the streets as people try to protest police brutality. We are dealing with a pandemic, but I know who you are. You are a resilient people, and you can overcome this just like we have overcome all the troubles in our past. But we can only do it if we work together. If you remember that those who disagree with you are still human beings, we don't have to agree on everything. And if everyone is thinking alike, is there really much thinking going on? Our differences make us stronger. And I appeal to this great people that even though we have failed, even though we are still continually striving for that great idea of justice, of liberty, and equality under the law, we can overcome anything. And I ask you right now to consider sending me to Washington to be your senator. And I give you my word, I will represent you. Harrington, thank you. And that concludes Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. We thank our candidates, all of them, and our panel of journalists, all of them. And if you missed any of the previous debates, tune in this Sunday, October 18th, beginning at 1 o'clock for the rebroadcast of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th Congressional District debates and also our program involving the U.S. Senate. And you can also find all our election information at myarkansaspbs.org slash elections. For now, and for all of us at Arkansas PBS, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.
Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas.